first video of us kind of going through kind of the process that I've outlined at the beginning. So recently, anyone who doesn't know, put on social media the other day about a new plan that I've got in place, like a little project for myself as a golfer, but also myself as a physical performance coach, working with a technical coach to essentially reach scratch within 18 months. Um, as a keen golfer myself, the goal is seems achievable on paper. So at the moment, I'm currently playing up a four handicap, being as low as a two handicap. Um, but going from a four to a scratch is a bigger task than a lot of people probably realize, especially when you take into account you've never been below a two. Um, I think the challenge is set out because we want to look at it in two ways. We want to look at it. Number one is almost a learning experience between a physical coach and a technical coach and how those two people work together to get a player to the next level. Um, you know, the goal is to kind of look at it from a slightly different perspective. So don't get me wrong, we're obviously going to be working on a lot of the, the same sort of technical things that most coaches will. There'll be lots of areas covered that your local pro will cover um, and people will be aware of that in general anyway. But there's, the hope is, is to try and go in down some different paths to try and identify how someone can get better without necessarily going down the more traditional route. So the best way of kind of explaining that is a modern way of golf coaching and learning. Um, the best way I want to kind of put it forward is an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach. So imagine kind of sports science, golf science, however you want to put it. We've got physical, we've got technical, we've got psychological, we've got stats, we've got so many different variables that and we're going to bring them together and try and see if that can improve performance overall. So to get started, obviously, I've asked young Aaron Kay to get on board with this journey, which he seemed more than delighted to do. Why have I asked Aaron? Well, the, the main thing is, oh, dodgy camera. I've kind of known Aaron for, I don't know, how long is it now? Five, five plus years, probably? Five, six years, five, something six like that. Years, yeah. something like that. So we kind of played golf together uh, in that time, but also, or well, most importantly, is he's been a client of mine in that time from a amateur scratch golfer turned pro in, in the last couple of years, um, doing his PGA and, and started to play kind of more kind of what Lincolnshire Midlands based um, coaching and training and whatnot, professional events. Um, I wanted to ask you, or I asked you, because I thought kind of this was quite an open idea to get your views, but knowing your background, you've got a background in sports science, um, which again, lots of golf coaches do, lots of golf coaches don't. Is it important? Not really, but from my perspective as a sports scientist, and that's kind of obviously my education and area, is I found that was quite something unique that could be in place because there's going to be similar language, similar understanding, similar kind of principles and philosophies at play, which would allow us both to explore those areas further, but also learn from one another. So kind of that leads me on to really kind of starting out is Aaron, basically what is your kind of coaching philosophy and principles as a young and up and coming coach? Um, so like even from, I kind of say like my own perspective, I've kind of, I'm like 23 now. So when I first started playing, I was only kind of, I think I was 10, 11, the like first time I ever picked up a club. So obviously going back 13 years or so now, and even kind of when I first started, I took it up naturally straight away. It was obviously a, a, nat a natural golfer, so to speak, but was kind of surrounded by, so to speak, kind of the, the ideal, what people class as the normal kind of coaching route is. You just go see a, a swing coach every two weeks. You do a lesson on, on the range, maybe you do a lesson on the short game, you do a lesson on putting, and then you kind of read a book or something and then you just go from there. And I, it works for kind of so long, but even then, lying down in handicap was kind of off 15, 16, was off, off 2 1 and was kind of was stalling a bit. But obviously, at the same time, I was getting more. 
clients and kind of what principles can relate to the, the golf swing and, and the golf game to make it a bit more a bit more in depth to try and get myself to that next level without actually seeking the help of others um and then it kind of got to a point where i was like i need to kind of have something set in stone that i can kind of follow move forward with um in order to kind of get to that next level and obviously then then starting university um did sports and exercise science there that opened uh, a kind of a lot of doors again just for myself because it kind of gave me that that edge and kind of a bit of a push to kind of go see the, the, or kind of seek out the right the right people that are kind of help with that whilst also realizing that there does need to be a bit of a process involved to get to that next level which is kind of then when started um started getting your advice um came to you and um, helped me on the on the physical side which turned out to be a big big advantage that was limiting me um kind of obviously the other routes the psychological routes the course management but rather than just seeing a coach kind of every two weeks and so um it was more of a okay can we implement this as like a goal and how we reach those goals within a set plan rather than just saying okay we'll try for that it was unlocking a few more doors that kind of allowed me to then come tumbling down to be a, in the space of a season playing off one to the next season practically on the verge on the verge of, of plus and un, unable to kind of shoot really kind of any any bad scores really just from having a process that I was able to follow um and I kind of adapting it and I and seeing that it's different for everyone which is is my philosophy which kind of it showed for me because those things that that allowed me to get to where I was and kind of have the knowledge I have now is stuff that I would never have expected. Um, at the time, they seemed very, very kind of complex, but when you actually break them down, they're actually very simple. So my kind of philosophy is that everyone can kind of still follow a, the, the same kind of process, though it will be individual to them. So it's all right saying, for example, that it might be they actually do need to change the swing, for example, but there's so so much more to it. How can other things allow them to change their swing? So they might not be able to make a swing change, which is holding them back. So they might need some physical strength and conditioning support. They might need some psychological sports psychology support. Um, and it's it's more it's more kind of to it than that in a simple but in a simple way. Um, I think a lot of amateurs will be able to benefit from kind of sticking to a, a progress and a plan um, that's individual to them, but again is kind of generic in the same way that the same process can be applied to other golfers as well. So the, the kind of my modern modern outlook on it is that it's it's changing all the time. So there's no there's no set way to kind of get from A to B, but it's kind of just exploring how you can and seeing what's right, what's, what works, what doesn't. And just being a bit more open-minded with it, really. And kind of, I wouldn't say, I mean, I wouldn't say getting with the times, but essentially it is, because um, coaching's obviously changing now. I mean, it, it's it's very, I wouldn't say it's rare, but it's 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 very unlikely that you, you see any top golfers or golfers that are improving and looking to really improve the games that will just see a coach once a month. And see big results from that really it's kind of you'll see once you've once you open the more the different doors and progress and having that plan there's more to it than than kind of just just having that set way of of what was you what used to be the norm really yeah it's a really good point and i think you know kind of that allows me to probably expand on again further why this idea has come from because i've seen firsthand with yourself how you were a really good player amateur wise but it was stuck at almost a you know a, you had almost a, a barrier certainly with the handicap and going to that next level and you was able to, to overcome that after a lot reasonably long period of time you know what two three seasons if not longer yeah, um, and, and you overcame that not through getting more golf lessons but through exploring different areas of 
performance that we're missing to allow you to take that next step. And, you know, it's easy to say, well, yeah, I was a one sort of handicap. And I, for me then to go down to scratch and like, you know, realistically you would have been plus figures if, if you hadn't turned pro is you had to think outside the box. You had to explore different avenues. You had to dig a bit deeper and or take a step back and then dig a little bit deeper of how the best way to move forward was. And it was almost like trying to take the complex and simplify it. Um, and in my line of work, I, I kind of, you know, I'm fortunate enough to work with a lot of very, very good players and be around a lot of good golf coaches. Um, and I, again, I know, you know, I have a good relationship with a lot of other sports scientists who work in golf and other sports. And kind of my philosophy, my experience, my, you know, what I've seen is, and we've discussed this lots over the years, is golf coaching typically is a long, long way behind a lot of other sports. Now, the last thing I want to do and we want to do is say that anything negative about golf coaches or PGA um, or how certain players should be doing more of this, that and the other, because it's really not about that. It's about trying to show all levels of golfers, especially amateur golfers, um, that if you want to get, if you've got clear goals, there's a process that can be put in place that will almost yield results, like almost a guarantee to get results. And I think the more, there's a lot of very good golf coaches out there, more than ever, who have a really good online presence and share a lot of their information. They question a lot of the norms. They kind of bust kind of common golf coaching myths, if you will. And they're kind of reinforcing kind of a lot of what we're going to be looking to. And the process is not going to be kind of just natural. It's not going to be a linear progression of four, three, two, one, scratch, all of a sudden playing good golf. It's going to be, you know, trying to show that background of how messy golf development is, but at the same time, how messy the player can make it on themselves. And even yeah. how the coach can be a big problem in the player's development. Um, unfortunately, I've seen it too many times where the player's not getting better and often getting worse in many respects, not because of the player themselves, but because of the coach coaching methods that are put in place. And I'm not just talking about golf swing um, or technique coaching. I'm talking about how we analyze performance, how we analyze progression, how we measure that individual as the individual and not as like a generic blanket, you know, you should be getting better because you're swinging it well or you're hitting more fairways or whatever, you know, I'm simplifying it there. So that's kind of what we want to be able to explore a lot deeper. And kind of the, t tonight or today's first session, video one, is to kind of show the starting point. Like step one is this is something I do with players. This is something you do and will do more of with players. It's almost like if you're going to start with a player, it's all right saying, okay, well, you know, let's take me as the perfect example. Four handicap, there's a few fundamental weaknesses there. Let's improve them, see where that gets you, and then we'll go to the next step. Well, that's fine, but what if you don't improve from those steps? Or what if you don't improve as much as you expect from those steps? And what if you potentially improve really, really quickly in those steps? And you're not prepared for the next point or you're not prepared to, you know, you don't basically, you've not looked deeper enough to it. You've oversimplified things and there's no long-term progress there. Um, you know, how many players go to a new coach and get better in a matter of weeks and go, oh, best thing since sliced bread, what they're teaching me is great. I've never been told this before. And then three years down the line, they're exactly the same place they were to that first six weeks now that's of course there's all loads of factors to that but it's an example of how you can get quick fixes um and, and that's something you've said to me is the last thing you want to be is a quick fix coach you don't want people walking in off after a round of golf and they've just had the shanked and they go right i need a lesson tomorrow to get them sorted we're looking at player development people who are really serious about improving the golf 
Um, it's not about what level you're currently playing at, it's about what level you genuinely want to get to. So yeah, yeah. what I'm going to go, I'm going to open uh, something now so everyone can see this, wherever it is, share screen. So, okay, that's up on your end, yeah? Yeah. Okay, so this is something I, I use with players. I think this is something I use with you in the past, Aaron. I think we actually yeah, used it at the start yeah, of this off season, didn't we? Um, now, I'm not going to go into too much detail, uh, kind of exactly what it is, but let's kind of just look at this in a very simple way of, I've called it basically performance profiling, okay? So it's kind of, the, the key thing really is if you are truly invested in becoming the best golfer you can, it's essential to know exactly what is required to reach that level. And that's almost like, okay, well, that's pretty obvious. If I'm a 10 handicap and I want to get to an eight, what really is required for you as the individual to be able to achieve that in a given time period? If I'm a six handicap and I want to be a scratch, it's all right saying I need to improve my short game, blah, 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 blah. But what really, really is required to get to that next step? Okay, so it's kind of really leaving no stone unturned. So I won't go through that quite now. I can go through this as another time. So what kind of I've outlined and answered this myself, this is essentially a self-analysis, a self-reflection first and foremost. Now, I like doing this with players personally because it asks the individual to take a step away from their own kind of world, their own game a little bit, and almost critically analyse and almost answer some hard truths in some ways. It's not about being negative or anything like that, but it's like, again, digging a bit deeper to come out of some potential answers that you've not found before. Um, and it's not, again, the technical coach. I, I keep saying technical coach because I'm a coach and I'll say oh, I'm a physical coach, but we're both coaches at the end of the day and there's a performance. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the technical coach will then be able to read this information and ask questions around it and then create their own analysis from there. So this is just step one and this is something every player can do. So really simple. I mean, obviously, you know, with the current situation, things have changed a little bit. So obviously kind of like the handicap aims are removed. But what I have put is, is kind of best growth score to date, qualifying and in practice. And I feel, I always feel, I don't know what your opinion is, Sam, but I always feel that's a, a key starting point because if I say, right, I'm a five handicap and I want to get to scratch in two years' time, but the best growth score I've shot to date is one over par, yeah. there's probably going to be some significant <laughs> development needed to make in a lot of areas of the game to achieve that. definitely definitely um so kind of my my example for me personally is i've shot four under gross in a competition so that tells me kind of looking at it from a neutral perspective well i've got the game to actually shoot a genuine yeah, low score the, to play scratch golf yeah, yeah. um but so that we can say straight away okay well what's preventing you from uh, with what you've already got, what is actually, it, it almost leaves a little bit of a clue, you could argue. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I've kind of put a few, a few questions. I've put a three years. Now we've kind of outlined what was it, 18 months to reach scratch? Yeah, 18, an 18 month process. Yeah. 18 month process. So kind of narrowed that time frame down because we're going at it a lot harder than probably what most other people could certainly amateur golfers could realistically apply taking into account resources time work commitments family etc um but a key thing i kind of ask here is three main barriers that could prevent you from reaching your outcome so i like that question because it's okay saying well if i do this this and this i can reach this all the positives but sometimes you've got to go well what actually might stop you you as the person, you as the individual, how are you getting your own way in some respects or what lifestyle factors might get in your own way? And some, sometimes this is hard to answer. I've done it with many different players and they've almost struggled to answer this or they've missed key things. So it's, again, as the coach, working as a team, you can also get a bit of an idea of how well someone can self-analyse. So I've kind of gone for a lack of discipline with my practice and playing regularly. Um, so for me, 
for work commitments and other factors around my kind of business and coaching work is I don't always make the time to practice and play as often as probably is required to play scratch golf. But that could be an excuse. You know, there's, a, there's enough hours in the day to make the time. But we know yeah, probably straight yeah. away there's a barrier there. And that might mean planning and simplifying playing and practice is a first port of call for us. Um, oh, definitely, definitely. Secondly, is like not committing to the individual processes. And this is like, this is the really important part of having a golf coach who understands the individual is, you know, because I'm self-taught and I've got a good understanding of performance, but because I'm coaching myself a lot and have done in the past, I'm going to be highly biased towards a lot of areas. So it'd be very easy for me to remove my mindset, my kind of discipline away from the processes that are needed to get me better. Um, you could say it's probably a lack of trust and focus in what's required. And I'm sure you see this with players all the time, Aaron. Oh, yeah, yeah definitely. It's, it, it's, uh, they, they, they'll, there'll be one or two ways. They'll, they'll either think they're sticking to it where, they are, but they're not. They're kind of doing like their own thing at the same time, which is then then they'll try and justify that they are trusting it, which isn't really trusting it. It's kind of again like an excuse that you're trusting it. Or they'll they'll try something and they won't see it work. So then they automatically don't trust it, and then it's just like a vicious circle for them. And then they think that, that something else needs to be required. Where if again, if it was more of like a process type thing, part of that process would be sometimes it isn't going to go the way it, the way it, the way it is and it could be potentially like another factor rather than just rather than yeah. them having that overall lack of trust which is catch 22 really it's like I say the normal goal for the other do or they don't it's kind of like no in between of kind of one day they, they do when they're hitting it well for example and then the next day they hit one bad shot and then it, it, it all goes to pot so but um, yeah Again, good key words there is process. So we'll come back to that in a second, but it's just something that you, you know, you as the coach, something you naturally say. Um, and it's probably a little bit of a cliche word or all, all too often used in all forms of coaching nowadays, but there's a real purpose behind it. It's just probably not utilized in the best way that it should be. Um, and we can explore that a little bit further. And then the kind of final one is not having the on-course mental ability to shoot consistently lower scores. So if I want to get scratch and I can shoot or have shown to shoot under par, but probably don't fully understand how I can do that more regularly or don't have the belief or the confidence there. And maybe there's a connection there to, to other things. So we could say it's a mental thing, but maybe there's a reason that there's a lack of confidence that stem to other parts of the game. It's easy to blanket term something as mental or technical or course management. Why is that a factor? It's not very rarely in my experience in anything black and white. Um, but all too often, it's perceived to be black and white. And I'm not being funny, but anyone who plays the game of golf knows how unbelievably complex it is as a game. You know, there's I mean, nothing simple yeah. in black and white about it. The, the, that if I, if I like... You could essentially break that third point down and say not having the course, the on course mentality. You could have the, the, all the confidence in the world. Um, for example, I don't know, take someone like Brooks Kepka, for example. He, he kind of just goes out there. You can see he's got every single bit of confidence in the world. But his, kind of, his game is kind of just hit it very, very far and then kind of go from there, really. But you, if you were, say, a very, very confident golfer, and you just you had all the confidence in the world to just slog your driver off every hole, but still that that's not necessarily saying you're going to shoot um, kind of kind of good scores. So that that mentality part of it could be something else. As much as you have the best mentality in the world, it's not always going to kind of go the way you want it to. Where you could have someone that has an understanding of their game and is understands how to kind of play. And actually work their way around the goal course, but isn't very confident in the way they're doing it. That's probably going to yield way more results than someone who's got all this confidence, but actually doesn't understand their own game. 
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think, you know, again, it's that it's that kind of in-depthness of different areas of performance, being able to understand those different areas and bring them together into a simplified way. And that's exactly, again, the exact philosophy we're trying to approach. Um, and then kind of the final thing was, if you were not to achieve your main outcome goal, what would the consequence of this be? And I kind of, again, I like that because it's putting the essence uh, essence wrong the focus on the individual um it's trying to look internally kind of we kind of think of the word consequences well well what what really could happen okay what potentially negatively could happen or what would be the worst case scenario if you not to do this and when you think of oh i'm just not going to reach my golfing ability or maybe what i wanted to achieve it's like well it's not going to be the end of the world yet how many golfers at all levels walk off a golf course or at the end of a season or end of a tournament are absolutely distraught by their standard of golf and not developing. So the consequence is, it means something personal. It's a first world problem as such, but it is a personal thing. And actually when you're kind of a bit more open and honest about it, that probably may lead you down a more clearer path of where you want to get to. And the thing with myself is it's easy for me to say this, but I've spent most, well, or virtually all my golfing career in some respects not fulfilling what I believe could be my golfing maximizing my golfing ability that's not to say I'm going to be a professional or or anything better than a scratch golfer far from it it's more to say is play stayed consistently to um, a reasonably low category one handicap with very poor processes in place and structure and doing when I say doing the right things that's open for interpretation but do it going about it in the way that we're trying to go about it so if I continue going down that path and then in 10-15 years time I'm off four because of age because of other factors that might be in play I'm actually more creeping up to a five six handicap I'd only be getting further and further away from that ability and it would be more of a point of going well I had an opportunity more through probably just lifestyle and I missed that opportunity. So to get that next opportunity might not come. It might take another 10 years. Um, it might just mean the goals are even more unrealistic. So it's kind of a little bit of that case from my perspective is I don't want to miss that boat again. Um, I would rather, if I miss that boat, if I don't reach the, the goal, that's fine, but I want to make sure I do everything I can to at least give myself that best opportunity, and that's the consequence. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, if, if it's everyone, if you if you kind of open every kind of possible route that you can, and you've applied it in the best way, and then you still haven't reached your goals, then at least you can say, okay, well, I've tried that, I've explored this, I've, I've done the correct kind of the correct plan, the correct process to it. And then if you then don't, but then say you, you stalled out, for example, or say you stayed off four, then you know that kind of then that's your, in a, in a sense, there's still a positive there because nothing, you haven't got any worse, but you, you'll still occasionally have better rounds and you'll have kind of the worst rounds, but nothing's kind of gone the opposite direction. So, but it, it's that opening them doors and kind of seeing for 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 the time period that that there is, it's will that do it? Will it won't? And it, and then like you say, if worse comes to worse, then well, hopefully it won't. I can't see it going that way. That you don't reach the goals. It's it's one of those things where it hasn't it hasn't kind of hasn't worked. But if you've explored the routes and you've you've, you've applied them in the correct way, there's no reason. There's no reason it can't. Yeah, absolutely. And that, it all comes down to giving yourself the best chance of being able to fulfill what you want to achieve. And I'm just going back up there and just going back to this. And, you know, so we've got outcome and process goals, really kind of basic goal setting links to psychology and saying, right, um, the outcome is obviously scratch. That's the outcome we want to get to in that time period but it's the processes that are put in place is going to allow you to get to scratch. So when you obviously mentioned the word process, it's almost like, well, we're no, we don't want to be thinking about the end goal. 
but we don't want to be playing and practicing with you of just going right I need to get scratch it's more like right if the process is correct and it's simple and there's a there's almost like an end goal to the mini process an outcome goal to the process goal if that makes sense then it means that things can be simplified things you can be held accountable by your coach and the individual as the player itself um you know for example is you know we we need to get your short game pitching better from 50 to 100 yards here's some drills we're going to work on for the next three months uh, and we're going to measure this through some uh, like quantifiable numbers whatever that may be let's just say if you do this two times a week for 20 minutes for the next three months we know you will improve by at least one to two levels in this whatever that necessarily means your your goal is to just apply that that, that is all yeah, your goal is 100 uh, percent. and that that kind of goes back to like while a lot of a lot of amateur golfers they can't really progress to that next level because they don't actually kind of know where they're at they don't actually kind of have any quantifiable data to apply to then compare against so like like that example we just said there about your pitching if we were to then say have a, a a set kind of first initial test to see how what your how good is your pitching or how bad is your pitching we then have something to compare against like a lot of a lot of amateur golfers they say oh oh this 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 part this part of my game's bad what are they actually comparing it to it's you don't really see many amateur golfers kind of comparing their stat that comparing stats to other high-end amateur golfers or kind of low-level tour players or even tour standard golfers and say it's very i've never had someone come to me and say oh my, my pitching's bad and I say oh kind of how do you know and they say oh well my strokes gain or my this stats compared to this to compared to tour pro is is bad they kind of just assume which not necessarily couldn't be the bad part of the game but unless you have that quantifiable data kind of which again you can make it very very basic just like a standard point system for a bit of chipping or pitching but at, at the simplest level to then say in three months time can we get this better can we get another one or two points on this which will equate to one or two shots less on the course and that would be then one bit one less variable that's kind of that we've looked at and, and kind of combated yeah absolutely and i that's kind of you know hopefully this is sort of highlighting the process to people of kind of or should we say the blueprint the planning of what goes into this and obviously going to in a little bit more depth than necessarily would be the case for individuals but this is kind of this first part is we're trying to identify your goal your outcome from there we need to dig deeper to know what that truly looks like for you. Um, again, my experience of this is saying to a, a player, what do you want to achieve with your game over the next year or the next six months or the next two years? And it will be just a very, almost a generic statement of, I want to get to this handicap or I want to earn this amount of money or whatever that may be, which is fine. But we need you need to be able to kind of make something more precise than that, even as an outcome goal. Um, so kind of like mine is mine's based on scratch because there's evidence here in this this information, like we say here, like of the growth score. There's evidence that that's achievable. The, um, there's evidence to say, well, actually, can I? What barriers are potentially going to prevent you from getting to scratch? There's nothing there that's significant like we talked about at the beginning where well I'm a, I, the best score goes shots two over so you know so that's a realistic outcome but it's still a big outcome and then from there that allows the player and the coach the team to genuinely start to make some processes around the outcome but now we need to identify what those processes are and why so we need to go on to that sort of the next step of this um okay so from there we go into something called like game profiling performance profiling often known as this is basically helps you identify strengths and weaknesses in line with your outcome goals okay again really important it's all right to say i've got a strength and a weakness i've used a really good example here 
Um, so in 2009, the worst putter from inside five feet on the PGA Tour made 66% of their putts. Okay, you, like if I said, if you ask 95% of amateur golfers, how many putts do PGA players miss, tour players miss from inside five foot, they'll say like 98%, you know, so 66%, basically two thirds, that's, that's ridiculous. So it's a kind of going, well, if, if your goal is to not miss from inside that range or to have a 90%, that means you're going to be better than a PGA Tour player, even if it is the worst yeah. player on tour on that. So it's, it's almost ridiculous to even, to even go down that path. They're putting on the best greens with the best equipment, the best players. It, realist, realistic Again, it, com- it comes, what it comes back to, to being honest and, and realistic with where you're at and where you want to be really i mean it's it's a lot of people again they, look, they watch all the golf on the tv and they only show them kind of holding them puts and again they automatically assume so then they compare and themselves against that when again if you just do that little bit looking deeper and, and reading the percentages like that no one wants to see them missing on telly so they're not going to show it effectively but like you say when when people say oh i need to hold 10 out of 10 inside five foot it's very unlikely it's going to happen yeah exactly that and i think that comes back to what i was saying at the beginning of busting some myths you know yeah, like going so. against conventional again i i unfortunately i've heard golf coaches compare a 15 handicap level of play and saying to him well if you want to reach 12 handicap and they're comparing the things they need to do to almost like a, a low level tour player um and and i'm not exaggerating that that's that's kind of what we're talking about so you know i'm probably as an extreme case but it's an example of to say well you can't have good process goals that are realistic and achievable for your individual outcome if you don't truly understand golf and the only yeah. way you're going to truly understand golf is not by talking to your mates at the golf club or listening to multiple different levels of player you might get a different view and some different perspectives but it's being able to really sit down and think and have a team around you and a coach who understands the kind of those key elements of golf that are often missed so really simple and this is something that i want to kind of players they can either do it themselves um, or I'm happy to kind of send this document to them so they can fill it out for them and they can even ask for some help from even this, myself or you. So really simple, and I'll, I won't go through those instructions, I'll show you straight out, is my goal is obviously scratch, and I'm currently off four, okay? So if we say as here as of today, I rated my drive and ability as a five out of 10. And let's say a 10 is scratch in this case. So I'm saying 10 out of 10 is sort of scratch level. And you've got to kind of be a little bit sensible here and realise that obviously I don't need to be a world-class driver of the golf ball or or a really good driver of the golf ball to be a scratch golfer. Not every department of my game has to be really, really good to be a scratch golfer. Otherwise, I'd be world number one. Um, But there's certain areas of the game that are must-haves for your outcome and your level you're trying to reach and also there's certain areas that are going to be bigger weaknesses than strengths and presence so here's an example what i've done is obviously i'm a five and i know if i could be an eight out of ten i know that would probably save me two shots in my handicap as of now okay um and i've just wrote kind of why so for example for me i have a big miss off the tee that can jump like essentially come into play out of nowhere so i can you know and when i say big miss because i can hit the ball a long way let's say um one in every eight drives might be a 40 yard miss left or right uh, which is absolutely destructive in a round of golf so i know that actually that level my level of driving is pretty low in my opinion at least this is a self-analysis you as the coach may look at it very, very different. So if I was just to go through each area of the game, we've gone like irons, pitching, chipping, blah, 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 course management on there. 
And I've just basically looked at all areas of performance in a nutshell. And what you'll do by the end of it is at the top, the difference, the number, the largest number is essentially your biggest area for development. So on here, I've got pitching, uh, I've got a few putting, few, you know what I mean? So you, you'll end up creating that picture of, well, oh, it's like me going, well, I'm a 10 handicap and I want to get to a five. Every area of my game is rubbish. No, there'll be some glaring, real significant weaknesses that if you could get them, each of them to go up a level, that might take you down yeah. to a seven handicap alone. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You just have to, the key, the key phrase here is pick your lowest hanging fruit. You just need to know what that is to begin with. Okay, so I don't know, what's your views on this, mate? So it's like even, it, it, this is like obviously definite kind of going back to what I said, where if a golfer has a, an understanding is realistic of their own ability and where they're at, um, if you just kind of say take the driving, the big miss in there. So if, if you're saying one in one in eight, was it, or one, one in seven or whatever, that you hit off the planet, that had essentially been okay. So there must be a reason why that's happening. And it could be technical, could be mechanical, could be psychological, but the process for that would be an okay, let's turn, say, a big miss into a miss and accept that we're going to hit a miss. We're not like like a lot of golfers would come to me and say, oh, I want to improve my driving. And again, I'm actually look at kind of say, if you were to look at tour stats, they don't always hit it down the middle of the fairway. I mean, if you were to look on the PGA Tour, for example, some of them are actually quite wild. Um, and it's essentially, you can still, don't have to be the best driver of the ball, for example, on that, to, to kind of, to, to still score and, and perform well. Like say, if we were to take a 40-yard miss and make it into a 20-yard miss, that would essentially be saving one shot, but still accounting, still giving you that opportunity to kind of rely and have trust and be realistic that you are going to hit, say, a big miss. And again, like another one would be the pitching. You say they have no idea on yardages. That's then throwing another variable into the process of, okay, so if, you've, if, you, if you don't know how far the ball's going to go, even just could be we're not talking to the yard we could be talking kind of in 10 yards so you could say oh my pitching wedge for the, the normal amateur golf my pitching wedge goes say 130 and if i hit a half swing of it it goes 100 that's then giving you just a simpler process something to stick to which say if you know kind of just even over a rough yardage of what it's going to go you take in kind of anxiety out of the equation you take in kind of relying on other things you're, you're taking not just hoping things are going to go. So if you, if you were to kind of just get within five yards closer, oh, that's actually quite a big exaggeration. If you were to kind of just get within, say, a couple more yards closer to the hole, it's going to be a big difference. You, you're going to be left with a shorter putt, say, for example, and you're automatically just giving yourself like another, another opportunity. So it's just, again, just simplifying it, but being realistic with what, with what you've got and where you're at. Yeah, and you know, almost you've gone one step ahead there in some respects because you've touched on how something skill or technical based could actually impact mentally. Um, and, and and let's say that does for this argument, then all of a sudden there's two areas that interconnect there, and so they're not gonna. So, how you train and develop those areas, it might mean there's a psychological. Um, purpose to how you train um, or practice your driving so all of a sudden it's a case of okay we're going to improve driving it's not just a black and white as hit more drives on the driving range it might be you know different types of practice to get better at driving different shot yeah. shapes for example um, and then essentially we do the exact same process for the physical now this is a little bit different because obviously as a physical coach, the physical side for me is pretty damn advanced as you would expect, but there's still weaknesses in there because I, you know, for me as the case study, I perhaps don't focus enough of my strength conditioning for golf related purposes. And that's something that's changed. So that's easy for me to say, well, you know, it's quite easy for me to get up to a higher level because I know what I'm doing. 
But one thing I would say for most golfers, because they don't do anything physically that's going to impact their golf, very rarely, and some don't even do anything physically in general, that the physical side is their lowest hanging fruit. And even, you know, even if you're trying to kind of go from a double digit handicap to a single digit handicap, the physical does have a lot more bearing on how that, how how easy that is going to be achieved um, than a lot of people think, um, regardless of skill areas. So for me, what we'd be looking at with a physical is for going, well, I'll use this as an example here, mobility. I know I have a left hip mobility restriction. Okay, so straight away, we know when we go to start looking at swing mechanics, we're going to be looking if there's something that's going on in the left hip, whether that's through impact uh, or other areas in the golf swing, or if there's something happening mechanically that Aaron identifies as kind of, well, that's the reason for your big miss, for example, we might be going straight away, okay, well, actually that interlinks with a left hip problem. So again, nothing's working in isolation. We're going into a bit more detail and we're analyzing that in a lot more in depth way. Definitely. And then, so it's it's kind yeah. of I I I agree with, with kind of most of that. Again, that's how things interlink. One process, well, kind of in 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 the process of kind of one one variable can link to another, and it's nothing like you say nothing's black and white. The, the swing mechanic might that big miss might not be related to the physical the physical side of it, but kind of progressing on that is for say for the sake of that isn't going to do you any harm. If that isn't the main cause, if anything, it's going to be another benefit, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one thing I would add here is you can see how um, my current is actually higher than the desired or the needed. And that sort of might seem a bit confusing. It won't necessarily happen with other areas. But from the physical is, what are the demands of golf? Do you need high levels of muscular endurance and stamina? Absolutely not. Um, and again we won't go into this too much today but it's just touching on typically that's where golfers overtrain the wrong areas and not you know you can see up here i've talked a lot more about strength speed and power um, i know that if i can hit the ball a long way and i'm stable and i can move the club better i know that's going to get me down to scratch a damn sight easier than if i just get a bit more stamina in play yeah 100 so and then the final one uh is psychological and this is the area that people struggle with the most because it's probably the newest or is the most untapped um and kind of because i'm because i know a fair amount about that side of things from sort of the sports science background like yourself and um, but also i'm quite tuned in to kind of self analysis I'm not saying i'm good mentally because i'm far from it as you'll see but I'm tuned in to be able to almost identify kind of where my limitations are. Um, and kind of what I've put here is a couple of key things that I actually interlink really is dealing with anxiety, worry. They're quite strong, powerful words. So you've got to look at them in the right sense. But for me is in competition mode, I will often think of the score and worry about the score. If I'm playing well, okay, well, I'm holding on. And if I'm not playing well, all I'm thinking is, right, I need to get this back. So instead of just playing, again, processes, there's a, there's a level of stress and anxiety there that when, that's, when, that's not, when I'm not in control of that, and I might not be in control of that through, um, let's say, bad night's sleep, so I'm knackered, or I'm really, really struggling with my swing, so I'm fighting really hard to just even kind of like make pars, there's that higher level of stress because you know you're going to struggle to, and we talked about this recently as a case of, well, if the if your if your psyche is not in the right place, that's going to affect you technically, but at the same time, maybe your technically, your technical mechanics that are kind of weaknesses are affecting your psyche. So it's a big question of yeah. well, what's coming first. We know they work together. You know the brain controls the body. You know, your mood has um, a huge, well, it influences how you move in general, but what's the root causes there? And that's what we're trying to get to. Yeah, I think, I think golf, 
it's a big, it's kind of opened up like a can of worms, really, within the last, what would you say, 10, 20 years, even the last couple of years. So this, the psychology part of it has become booming in a sense that it's, it's, it does have a big, all get kind of, if you like, if you go through them, different subcategories there, every single one of them at some point, every, every golfer in the world, no matter how good they are, amateur or tour pro, have probably had a problem with, with with all of those. If not, most golfers probably have, most amateur golfers that are trying to get better and can't, they probably have a problem with all of them in one round. So it's kind of, it's, again, being realistic and honest with kind of where you're at with kind of your site, your own psychological kind of development with your golf. I mean, someone's come off saying, oh, I was so confident out there. Was they? Was they though? They could be confident, but their anxiety could have been through the roof, which is, yeah. yeah, could go back into kind of like that could relate to physical limitations then that, that then that then creep in. You could be confident over a shot, but anxious about it at the same time. So it's again being realistic and kind of doing the, the, the profile like you've done to see where potential improvements can be made, especially with the psychology. Yeah, and this is this isn't an easy process to do, and it's not necessarily about getting it one hundred percent right, but it's more, you know, obviously they're my answers, they're taking into account my playing level and my outcome goal, and you'll notice how there's the the um, optimal for scratch in the psychological side, they're all really high, so they're all eights, nines, tens, whereas with some of the other areas like the physical, they're a bit lower because I'm already more than uh, advanced enough physically to play scratch goal. Um, there's some parts of my game that are already more than ready to play scratch goal. But the psychological side, if you're going to play to a, that level, which is two to three levels above where I am currently, then as someone who knows kind of more sort of higher level golf ins and outs of what's required is you you can't be someone who's going on the golf course we'll talk we'll take negative or positive self-talk where i'd say well i'm quite hard on myself i'm quite self-critical now if if i if i'm more self-critical than i am positive and always kind of trying to get that positive self-talk for just basic psychological techniques that are proven to work then no matter how much better i get skill wise and physically in course management I'm always going to be limiting to what scores I can shoot and how consistently I can play. It's the same with, you know, the ability to relax. If I'm almost playing constantly from that first tee at a slightly um, anxious level, you're only a shot away from that anxiety jumping up. And yeah. the round exactly. goes on, if you're playing well, you've got a score going, and I know this from first-hand experience, and I'm sure loads of golfers can relate to this. If you've got a score going and you're already feeling a little bit anxious and then you get to, like, say, the last five holes where it's about you know finishing your round off and if not going up a level, you're at one bad shot in those can all of a sudden just unravel and mean that you can lose your swing, you can lose your timing, your heart rate will increase, your focus will get too zoned in, or not zoned in, wrong word, uh, like tunnel vision so you'll make a lot of poor decisions and um, there'll be almost a, a need to want to score as opposed to letting it happen again going through the processes um, and you can tell I, I'm talking from a lot of experience here and I'm sure you've been through this yourself on the golf course multiple times. Yeah 100% I mean obviously with my background this is kind of one of the one of the ones that i take most interest into and kind of going off what you said you can have the most technical perfect swing in the world you can be your, your physiological elements through like the s and c can be perfect to the technical part of it but if certain things of like this are lacking it's not going to happen it really isn't going to happen because if you're if you've got if you've got heightened anxiety say you're on on the first tee Having anxiety is good. Just if you don't have any anxiety when you first start, and then that's probably count. That's probably counterproductive. Um, but if you've got too much, for example, say just looking at it simply, all you're doing then is limiting is is limiting um, 
the ability to kind of pull off the 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 best chance you've got if you've got the best technical and best physiological state if you have so to speak because all this is going to do is then hold you back so it's you've got to find that kind of that medium really i mean if you say if you have if you have if you haven't got a technical if you've got a poor technical swing and a poor physiological state with heightened anxiety then that is essentially just a recipe for not happening today i think kind of expanding on that as well is you know the psychological side is absolutely essential to playing better golf regardless of your level um you know there's no um what's the word there's no you can't you basically can't argue against it it's, it's an absolute necessity but the thing the, yeah but when we think of psychology and like mental skills, especially in golf and in sport, but you know, golf as well, is golfers and coaches will almost say, well, that's for a certain level. That's when, you know, you, you need to start working on that certain, when you get to a certain playing level, um, which I think is fundamentally wrong. I think that's a load of rubbish. I think secondly is a lot of golfers and coaches will say about golfers as well is, it's not the technique that's a problem, it's mental. Now, mental, that's like me saying, you've got a physical problem. Well, what do you mean? Well, it's just physical. People, what's lacking physically? Oh, well, it's, you know, yeah. it's a blanket term. Mental is a blanket term. We look at this, we know there's loads of different areas that you could be, you could be, you could be brilliant at some of these areas. Um, but how do you know, you, you know, that could be like, let's say, for example, you are a, a 10 handicap you could be amazing at arousal control you could be amazing at dealing with anxiety so it doesn't mean it's mental in the same sense but it might be something as simple as attitude towards learning you might your attitude towards learning again that's probably a little bit vague but it might be as simple as when you do have a lesson you think you're right and you get yep. looking out the process of listening to your golf coach or yep you might just zone out because you don't believe you're going to learn anything um, working within a team this is one i see quite often with more elite players is they because they've never worked with a team or maybe they haven't created their own team they've almost someone's done it for them and brought certain people into that team they don't know how to communicate they don't know how to bring that team together or or kind of see it as a team approach they just often say well, it was still me and I've just, I'll, I'll listen when i want to listen so mental could be nothing to do necessarily what you're doing on the golf course either yeah definitely i mean it's again it's kind of essentially a, a process with a process the mental game of it i mean there's the thing with it which why it has such an impact is nothing is predictable so you can't have a kind of a, a set mindset of what's going to happen so that's why things such as anxiety and arousal and the ability to relax nerves, stress, they all play such a big part in, in, in golf, even in, in everyday life. Something happens that you don't expect to happen. You're either going to get stressed, anxious. If you hit a shot off the planet that you was not expecting, no matter how much you've self-taught yourself that you're going to hit it where you want to hit it and, it, and you haven't, if you can't then have that ability to con control it, just so to speak it's just going to set off all a kind of a few of the other categories that, and then and then it's just going to all it's just going to do is keep tumbling 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 when actually nothing was really going that bad not to that point yeah 100 percent um and i think you know this is something we will cover more in depth and i think you know even from i'm sure the viewers would be able to see this quite obviously but there's a there's a there's going to be quite a lot of focus towards the mental side for my development, but it's also an area I want us to explore and help others with because it's, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's very misunderstood, a lot of it. Um, yeah. And maybe the areas that are understood are probably misused. So that's something you know we'll expand on moving forward. So to kind of wrap it up, um, yeah, so to wrap it up, what then we will do from here is kind of analyze this information um, 
you know, like I said, identify the lowest hanging fruit. Now we don't want to go, I might say for each category, so you can see on the mental, I'm going to choose just the three highest numbers. So we know dealing with anxiety, uh, positive self-talk, ability to act. We know those three areas are going to be the biggest areas for development to begin with. And then we will look at maybe how those areas interlink. Then we'll go do the exact same with the, um, the skill one and the same with physical. So we've got just essentially nine individual areas um, of three subcategories. We'll look how those might interlink. So dealing with anxiety might link to the big miss as we talked about. Yeah. So we know, okay, well, whatever process is put in place to make those areas better might work hand in hand rather than in isolation. So that's where the analysis side comes in and more communication between me, me and yourself. Um, but to get started, we obviously have to identify this. So if I just go down really quickly, um, this is kind of what the next steps look like for us moving forward. So over the coming weeks, and I'll, I'll let Aaron add to this, but the first step again for me is I'm gonna do a, physical movement screening, so I do with all golfers and all clients. I'm going to do it myself. I haven't done it for probably 18 months. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where I'm at. And then I can take that information and feed it back to Aaron as the technical coach, just like, you know, someone would if I, they came to see me anyway, I'd feed back to their coach and them as the player. Um, then Aaron's going to look at assessing technique of each area of my game. So we'll say full swing, driving irons, pitching, chipping, putting, and, and potentially other areas. So just to kind of be able to go, right, we know there's some fundamental areas of weakness, technically, say, in bunker play, but that needs to get better. But we also know that realistically, um, if he wants to be playing scratch golf, he's not going to be going in that many bunkers. So as long as he's yeah, yeah. ganking them in the bunker, we, just, we don't want to be spending hours a week on bunker play when it might be worth at best one shot around. Um, yeah. Again, that's more in depth and we'll go into it at another point. And then obviously we'll link the physical and the technical together. Um, and that's where the bigger overall analysis will come to. Then Aaron, which I want you to just talk about in a minute, is we'll, essentially we're going to go through some skill testing for each areas of those games that we just talked about. And then with all that information put together, which may sound a lot, and I guess on paper it is, and we're kind of putting it in quite a, um, I'm brushing over it in a sense, because obviously we're the experts, but we can show you how actually that, a lot of information, once it's narrowed down, it can become very, very simple, precise and focused. We're trying to get away from the not a lot of information simplifying something and making it unfocused we're doing it the opposite it's just good go good coaching in our view um, but yeah. if you're going to do it properly or if you're going to do it effectively then you're going to need to understand different areas and how they impact one another in an in-depth manner to begin with 100 100 percent. i mean it's like you say it's it's putting a spin on things of what of what the norm is and kind of adapting it to what's to 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 what's most effective really is kind of the way to put it yeah so i mean um yeah so the next steps obviously we're going to cover them we'll go through that we'll we'll do some videos of each and obviously hopefully we'll be outdoors with some of these and it's not just going to be you know us talking and going through too much kind of data um so what so kind of from here, anyone who's got this far, hopefully, if you can, I'm just going through these slowly, you can pause it as you go. You can either create your own, you know, on a piece of paper, as simple as that. You don't even need to choose every area. You know, you could leave out the physical for now. You could leave out the mental and just do these key areas. I mean, any start to any, anything kind of along the lines is a good starting point, really. Kind of, if you've never done it before, probably the simpler the better, really. Um, yeah, if, there is any, if there is any kind of better golfers that are kind of relating to most of this um, and understand it kind of a, a bit more, then then yeah, 
probably a bit more detail for them, but to start with, kind of, you don't have to have kind of 10, 12 categories on there. You could just kind of have three or four, really. It's a lot of information uh, to begin with, and, and you don't, you know, you don't want to feel like overwhelmed with it. So, or um, I've got this as a template that I can send to the individual. You can fill it out yourself, and I can, I'm happy to review it. Aaron could do the same um, from his areas. Or, you know, what are we reviewing? We're not reviewing, obviously, this is your self-reflection, but just helping you guide through it, asking some certain questions that might be able to make you think of it, things from a different, uh, different angle and come up with uh, a better, more reliable and accurate answer for what's probably required for your development. Um, and then from there, you know, it, the next steps, something we'll obviously show over the coming weeks. Yeah. Okay. Um, Anything more from you, mate? Or happy with where we're going? No, I'm all happy with that. I say it's um, kind of, I say, yeah, more than happy. I think we kind of explained everything there. Oh, got all dark. Perfect. Well, hopefully that's all made sense. Um, and we'll refine our video recording processes as, as we move along. Um, but for now, look forward to the next step. Thank you.